One of the key points to think in my, keep in mind as we discuss the further developments and divergence of the hominin line is uh, the fact that we are not just biological species. We are also cultural. And so we really have to look at this increasing role that culture plays over the course of hominin evolution to um, be able to understand hominin evolution. Our connection to primates represents part of a biological continuum, but it also, as we talked about last week, represents part of a cultural continuum as well. And so we talked about great ape cultural examples like tool use, like language, like uh, these greeting displays that chimpanzees have um, that really give us some insight, at least into the cognition and the function that culture may have played in some of our early ancestors. Most of what paleoanthropologists and archaeologists have to base comparisons on is, is material culture, predominantly that which is evidenced through stone tools. So um, we recognize that stone tools have played an increasingly important part of our uh, in our evolutionary history. Uh, they've It's been a... a Advances in stone tool technology have been associated with a greater reliance on eating meat, which is then, um, it correlates with increasing brain size, correlates with increasing social complexity, uh, the complexity of cooperative arrangements after the meat is found, uh, patterns of uh, investment in offspring, um, and kind of how long our children stay children. So, um, material culture then is our kind of best guess at measuring what the cultural capacity would have been for these early hominins. Now the problem of course is that um, very only a very scant part of their culture is going to be represented in material culture because um, stone tools of course are going to preserve very well What's not going to preserve very well are any more um, kinds of uh, perishable materials that are used, like sticks, like uh, uh, thin grasses that are braided or woven together, etc. So um, we only have just a few pieces of what their entire cultural complexity <coughs> would have been. Material culture is well represented after about 2.6 million years. <laughs> as we look at this transition from uh, into what we call old one tools, um, but we know that even non-human primates will use tools, sometimes made of perishable materials, sometimes stone tools themselves. So uh, chimpanzees use sticks uh, and grasses, orangutans use leaves, um, and you know chimps will also use stones to break open nuts, but um, we don't have even very much uh, material represented from chimpanzee nut cracking. So, the roots of culture lie in the cognition that we share with great apes. The building blocks are present in great apes. Great apes become increasingly cultural as time goes on. Over the course, though, of hominin evolution, um, we end. We start with some neurological reorganization that comes with bipedality, uh, kind of changing the energy budget of early hominins uh, and changing uh, the kind of the payoffs to sociality as we start to move out into the African savanna. Um, this results in more elaborate tools, more elaborate social relationships, which then in turn select for greater intelligence, which then in turn selects for greater neural elaboration. So it's this complex, uh, what we call coevolutionary process by which bipedality kind of jump starts it and it's followed then by a shift in diet as we moved out into the African savanna. Combinations of bipedality and the shift in diet give us more calories to allocate to different um, different pathways, different investments, which then allow for lar slightly larger brain size. This then in turn influences um, what we're able to eat, uh, influences our sociality, influences our success at becoming better scavengers uh, initially, at eventually transitioning into hunters that will uh, be associated with then a greater energy budget, more calories, which can then be allocated towards even larger growth and brain size. So we end up having what we call a ratcheting effect. A ratchet is a tool. Um, it's not just like urban dictionary definition of ratchet, someone being gross or whatever. Uh, a ratchet as a tool is like a screwdriver in some ways. When you turn the ratchet to the right, uh, the screw tightens. However, when you turn the ratchet to the left, unlike with a screwdriver, it stays 
uh, it just stays where it is. Um, when you turn a screwdriver to the left, you're going to unscrew. So turning it to the right and then turning it to the left represents a net gain of nothing. Uh, with a ratchet, turning it to the right and then turning it to the left leaves you at what you gained by turning it to the right, which can then be followed by another turn to the right and another turn to the right. So we get this ever-increasing commitment to um, this uh, human ecological niche and human life histories. When we look at early tools, we've got definitive evidence that 2.6 million years ago uh, fossil hominins were using stone tools. We've got some sites that have old one style pebble tools like that pictured above um, that have uh, fossil hominins including Australopithecus garhi and uh, even some members of early homo and have what we call faunal assemblages or um, animal bones that are associated with cut marks on them. That is the best that we can get in terms of uh, unequivocal evidence for the use of stone tools by humans in the consumption of meat. The Oldowan industry uh, includes small sharp flakes that are removed from a rock nodule. They are made to a standard size and shape. Um, my kids right now enjoy quote unquote crafting, kind of like Minecraft. And so they will often take stones from our yard, from our cabin, etc., uh, and fashion their own stone tools. And, and they're discovering that making stone tools is not very easy. We've lost a fingernail from uh, missing the stone that you were striking and hitting your finger. We've had bruised fingers. We've had uh, certainly fingers that hurt. Um, all in the name of, of figuring out how to make our own tools. So the kids are having a great time with it. Uh, there is a little bit of danger involved, of course, but you know, um, when you've got boys between the ages of about five and 12, uh, danger is sometimes their middle name. Um, we also, in Oldowan technology, uh, have battered hammer stones that were used to break the flakes off course. So we've got evidence of the hammer stone. Um, we've got evidence of what's left behind after flakes have been um, taken off. A lot of these early Oldowan tools include basically like scrapers, which would scrape along the length of bone and remove any connective tissue. Um, there are also um, hard sharp edge tools that would break open the bone to get to the bone marrow. We have some questionable uh, stone tools that date back to about 3.3 million years. Um, these are from a site in Kenya called Lamokwe 3. Um, there's less evidence for the breaking off of flakes. If you look at the tool on the bottom, uh, the bottom picture, you can see that some has been removed to make that slightly sharper edge, but um, not nearly as many flakes have been broken off of that core. They may have, instead of using the flakes for cutting and stuff, they may have uh, used the cores for pounding. And so this could be something like going after roots and tubers. Roots and tubers are thick and fibrous and hard to eat. Um, one way to make them softer is to process them or pound them. There's disagreement among paleoanthropologists, though, as to their dates and their significance. So some anthropologists say, well, this pushes that date of the emergence of stone tool use back to uh, earlier Australopiths, maybe even Australopithecus afarensis, who's the last potential common ancestor with the genus Homo. Uh, others say, no, we don't have the associated hominin, we don't have faunal assemblages, we don't know what these tools were used for, so maybe this is just some, na some natural pattern of rock breaking. Once we've discovered um, remains, whether they're paleoanthropological or, uh, or material archaeological remains, we've got to figure out how old they are. That's something that is critically, critically important to us. And so there are two main techniques uh, or dating methods that are used. There's relative dating, which gives us a kind of a chronological rank of uh, what's older, what's younger, and there's absolute dating using chronometric, including some radioisometric techniques. Relative dating is uh, built upon the idea of stratigraphy, that, that stratigraphy is defined as the study of sequential layering of geological deposits. And so one of the best examples of stratigraphy in New Mexico is the stretch of 550 between Bernalillo and Cuba. And when you look out your window as you're driving through the stretch, you see these horizontal bands of different color dirt uh, as the <clears throat> sides of the mesas have worn away as they've cut through uh, some of the mesas to lay the road and st such. And so you can see these distinct deposits of different kinds of material. Uh, stratigraphy allows us to rank materials from youngest, that is closer to the surface, to older, those are deeper. 
So we know that, that something found at 50 centimeters is going to be younger than something found at 70 centimeters, but older than something found at 30 centimeters. Um, we also, uh, though, recognize that it's hard to get an absolute kind of window of time through relative dating. So um, there are some consistent things. Um, for example, um, we've got uh, certain benchmark fossils that are in certain strata. So when you find one of those fossils, it only occurs in one layer of deposits and it's consistent from Saskatchewan all the way down to the coast of Mexico, then you can assume that the strata there where you find it, the stratum where you find that fossil is such and such age range. Um, but disturbances can shift strata. Um, there are also widely different rates of accumulation across sites. Um, Absolute dating techniques, or these chronometric techniques, allow for an age kind of window, um, such and such number of years plus or minus some degree of error. Uh, and so predominantly uh, we use radioactive isotopes that have known half-lives or, half or rates of decay. One of the most useful for the paleoanthropological record is potassium argon dating. Potassium 40 decays to argon 40 with a half-life of roughly 1.2 billion years. So in 1.25 billion years half of the uh, potassium will, will be converted to argon. In another 1.25 billion years uh, half of that remaining potassium will be converted to argon and so on and so forth. So um, particularly for those things that are about five to one million years, so these early hominins that we're talking about in East Africa, um, the potassium argon dating is incredibly useful. Um, one of the things that helps with potassium argon dating is uh, volcanic deposits because they're pretty high in potassium and because uh, they also, they heat up the rocks and it's something in the process of the heating of the rocks that kind of resets the molecular clock, so to speak. Um, so if there have been volcanic eruptions that have heated up these fossils, um, it kind of resets their clocks too. Uh, and so we, we can date those volcanic eruptions and then have kind of like a known starting point <coughs> um, and then go from there. Potassium argon dating is not the only one though. Every, almost everybody's heard of carbon-14 dating. That is only useful for organic material and it can't really go back any more than about 50,000 years. So it's not going to be relevant for dating fossil hominins from 5 to 2 million years ago. Uh, it would be relevant for dating human remains that date to like 12 or 10,000 years ago. It's also relevant for dating the faunal assemblages of like Paleo-Indians uh, as they were coming into the New World. Things like that can be accomplished through uh, carbon-14 dating. But there's uh, Ken Ham from the Answers in Genesis has used carbon-14 dating to date dinosaur fossils and gets back values of like 6,000 years, which we know from the geological record that that is not the case, that the Earth is much older than about six to 10,000 years. And so um, you can misuse techniques and get date ranges that are just basically bunk, that don't really give you any usefulness. And so I really like this particular uh, graphic that just compares some of these different techniques that can be useful in both archaeology and paleoanthropology. We've got writing, we've got the paleomagnetic wandering, which the text talks about being a form of, um, of relative dating versus um, the isometric techniques. Um, we've got dendrochronology, which is counting the tree rings, um, radiocarbon dating going back to really no more than about 50,000 years. You can see some of these other techniques as well. So we've got some, uh, some techniques that are absolutely appropriate for old sites. We've also got techniques that are absolutely appropriate for more recent sites. All right, so now that we have an idea of um, how to uh, date what we find, now we're going to talk about what features uh, really mark this transition from a hominid or hominoid um, from your textbook uh, to hominin. And so there are four closely related characteristics that mark hominins in the fossil record. One of those is locomotor behavior, specifically hominins are bipedal. 
hominoids are both bipedal and quadrupedal. So when we're looking at this divergence between apes to, into this hominin line, we are looking for species that have evidence of bipedality. Uh, we've got changes in our brains and our pace of development. These are minor at first, but do become more pronounced as uh, as hominins evolve. We've got changes to our teeth. Remember, we talked about that non-honing canine, right? Uh, non-honing chewing. Um, we see a reduction in the uh, canine relative to uh, other teeth. We see larger premolars and molars with thickened enamel. This will eventually reverse after we develop uh, the intentional use and control of fire. Um, but initially, uh, hominins are marked by bigger, broader, more thickly enameled teeth, and then we've got tool use. <clears throat> what we see across the hominin fossil record, at least until roughly uh, 1.8 million years ago with Homo erectus, um, is, and even after that, as we look across um, you know, the African multi-regional um, deposits of modern Homo sapiens, we still find mosaic evolution. That means in different places at different times, we get interesting combinations of both primitive and derived traits. Um, so we don't get a nice sequential development of first there's bipedality, then uh, we start using, t or we change our teeth, then we start using tools, lastly our brains develop, right? We end up with some fossils that are clearly evolutionary dead ends, but have some interesting mix uh, with some pretty uh, sophisticated, derived, more recent traits, um, but those then end up being eliminated from our lineage. So it's not um, a perfectly nice linear um, evolutionary series. I And the text also uses this terminology. It's not an evolutionary family tree, it's an evolutionary family bush. Um, we don't have one clearly defined trunk. <clears throat> as soon as we have a trunk, we start branching out in every possible direction. We've got a lot of endpoints, a lot of terminal branches that uh, are evolutionary dead ends. And ultimately, the only hominin that we have left living on the planet now is uh, anatomically modern humans, Homo sapiens sapiens. So part of our goal this week and next, and, and even the week after, is going to be establishing kind of the why. What was it about um, increasingly complex hominins as we transition from Australopithecus that we'll talk about today to early Homo, as we talk about Homo erectus next week, as we talk about modern humans the week after. What was it that selected for this particular complex of traits? Um, because it's very specific. There's no way we could take just a bunch of chimpanzees and put them on um, Io, the moon of Jupiter, uh, and expect that if we came back in a million years that they would have magically turned into humans. We're talking about very specific ecological characteristics that interacted with very specific early cultural markers to uh, shape our evolutionary history. So we start with bipedality. The reliance on bipedalism differentiates early hominins from apes. The main reason that bipedality evolved, you know, regardless of the advantages that come after it evolved, was because it's more energetically efficient. Now, it's not super efficient for chimps to walk bipedally, but a fully committed biped can travel twice the distance for the same amount of calories uh, as a quadrupedal chimp um, or a chimp sometimes walking bipedally. So um, one estimate shows that this bipedal hominin could go 11 kilometers for the same energy expenditure as a chimp over four kilometers. We've hooked up chimps, we've hooked up humans to, uh, to treadmills with all sorts of uh, sensors and measured things like VO2 max and such, and, uh, and it's unequivocal. Um, similarly, so once we have a calorie savings, and as we get even larger range sizes, we're going to see even more energetically efficient bipedality or an even more energy efficiency through uh, bipedality. So those savings are only going to magnify as we have larger home ranges. So we cut our energy budget in half automatically by standing up and walking on two feet. That leaves us with some options as to what we can do with those energy savings. We can increase body size and even um, bipeds that are like 50% larger than uh, quadrupedal chimps can still move more energetically efficient than quadrupedal chimps can. We can increase our range size. As we start exploiting the savanna, increasing our range size is going to be critically important. When we think about the nature of resources on the African savanna versus in the African forests, in the forest, the bulk of the biomass, that is the bulk of the organic tissue, is above ground. Um, tropical rainforest trees are super tall, 
but they also fall really hard. They have very shallow root systems. Um, as we clear tropical forests for agriculture, they're rich initially, but within five or 10 years, um, the nutrients have been stripped from the soil. So that depth of organic material doesn't go down very far. Um, most of the plant material is above ground. As we look at savanna plants, they change where they store most of their plant, where they store most of their biomass. Uh, if you've ever dug up a yucca, sometimes you need a crane. So they can have tap roots that are upwards of 30 feet. Um, think about the developed root systems of arid climate plants. They all have very deep roots, very complex roots. Um, most of their growth is below ground. So um, that makes it maybe harder to find. Um, and we're also going to see, I mean, in, in the tropical rainforest, there's growth everywhere like all you have to do if you run out of food is turn around and look at the tree behind you you've got more food right some of it is patchily distributed certainly fruit eating um there are only going to be groves of of fruits uh, in some areas they're only going to be seasonally available so you've got to map temporal and spatial uh as a patchiness but in the savannah that's even more magnified i mean heck you're gonna have areas that don't have any plant growth um so unless you're eating dead grass uh, or i guess the equivalent to new mexico would be chimisa or maybe even i mean maybe i'll grant you mesquite which early paleo indians did <coughs> eat but uh yeah, it's, um, you're going to have to travel farther distances just to find enough food. So bipedality enabled that larger home range size. Uh, bipedality and the energy savings can also be converted into increased reproductive output. Uh, you're able to produce richer milk. You're able to grow your babies faster. You're able to shorten the interbirth interval between babies. Bipedality first evolved in the forest, probably in this mixed woodland kind of habitat, probably not dense tropical rainforest. Um, but there was an advantage to bipedality even before we left the forest. Once we leave the forest and branch into the African savanna, the benefits of bipedality are magnified. And, and then we get those corollary benefits that introductory texts often talk about. You can see over the tall grass, for example, which helps you to detect predators. Probably, you know, not very good to uh, to be quadrupedal in these kinds of environments because you really aren't going to see uh, the movement of the grasses that cues you into things like lions being present. Um, it allows you to reduce the surface area that's exposed to UV radiation. I mean, our bodies were black, our hair was black when we first started uh, evolving as hominins. And so if we're out on the savanna with a black body and black hair and, and the full length of our back is exposed to UV radiation, we're going to overheat. And, and essentially cook our brains. So by standing up and retaining selectively the hair on our heads while we lose our body hair, we um, are more able to efficiently cool, which means we're not cooking our brains. Um, lastly, it talks about, uh, these introductory texts talk about the advantage in terms of carrying resources back to a home base. But you know what? Chimpanzees will sometimes transport their hammer stones uh, long distances. They will sometimes, if they find a nice anvil stone, transport the nuts themselves long distances. So um, sure, it's great to be able to carry things, but it's this is not going to be the reason that bipedality evolved. So you know, this is my um, the, this is why I emphasize thinking about hominin evolution in the way that we do. You know, why do the traits evolve? Certainly, once traits evolve, they can be co-opted into other functions. We can get things like exaptations. But really looking at the why, we didn't develop bipedality just so we could carry things, right? We started walking bipedally. And then, once we were walking bipedally, we were like, oh, hey, look, I can carry these things for far distances. <coughs> So we've got an abundance of evidence for both habitual and um, obligate bipedality. Habitual bipedality means that that's how you're usually moving. Um, obligate bipedality means that you can't really move any other way. Um, and so there are dramatic changes uh, as we develop bipedality in the pelvis. Specifically, it becomes shorter and broader. It also kind of rotates forward and upward, which changes the path of the uh, birth canal, which is partly associated with modern humans having a greater difficulty uh, uh, during labor and delivery. Um, what this does, as the pelvis even extends around the sides, uh, the phalanges of the pelvis, 
This helps to stabilize the line of weight transmission from the lower back to the hip joint so that we are not plagued in standing up straight by lower back injuries. Now, we could say that in a modern context we are plagued by lower back injuries, but that has more to do with our um, our relative sedentism than it does anything else. I mean, our lower backs hurt because we're not regularly getting out and walking and um, we're also maybe not regularly stretching and things like that. So of course we're gonna have some chronic, uh, specifically lower back pain. We lose the grasping big toe and that happens pretty early on. Um, there's an advantage to having the big toe in line with the other toes and that's going to come with foot stability which is going to make us even better bipeds. Our legs elongate to lengthen our stride. I mean bipedal locomotion is a heck of a lot more efficient when you can take uh, big steps rather than just small ones. Um, we uh, or we enable this full extension of the knee, um, which also gives us uh, more energy savings as we're changing our stride. Our legs are kept closer together, so we don't have this kind of bow-legged sway as we walk. Again, associated with greater energetic efficiency. Um, some of these pelvic and foot changes are in place by 4.4 million years, with a fossil we'll talk about in a minute named Artipithecus. Some of them, though, uh, don't become firmly established until about 4 million years. So after 4 million years, there is no doubt that the hominins that come after that are fully committed to bipedality, uh, and that this bipedality is both habitual and obligate. Um, and this includes changes in the spine. So your textbook has a really really good graphic that shows some of these traits, that compares these changes in the pelvis, uh, that looks kind of at the um, curvature of human spines relative to like gorilla or chimpanzee spines, uh, and looks at some of these foot changes, but we can at least look at the pelvis and the foot here. Uh, chimpanzees still very clearly have that grasping big toe. They have a pelvis that is taller than it is broad. Um, what we see with the Australopithecus africanus pelvis, uh, this is one of the gracile Australopiths, um, we see a pelvis that's a lot more modern, um, that has gotten broader and shorter. Um, we see a foot that has a big toe, um, though still long with some degree of flexion, uh, that is at least in line with the other toes. And then of course when we look at the fully modern pelvis, um, we've got modern pelvic dimensions. We've got uh, this fully modern foot. One interesting thing that isn't in place with Australopiths that does become pronounced, um, particularly as we move into Homo erectus, is the arch in the foot, which helps to <clears throat> minimize the stresses placed on the joints, the knee joints uh, and hip joints in particular, and further helps to um, kind of result in those energetic savings without corresponding pain. We see changes across the hominin line in brain size. This is something that becomes particularly noticeable after the advent of the genus Homo. Uh, we'll talk about... This is something that becomes particularly notable after the advent of the genus Homo. We'll talk about that towards the end of this lecture uh, in our, our third part. Um, but. Uh, these larger brains um, are allowed by some of these earlier changes like uh, the development of bipedality. Um, because our brains get larger, we have to give birth to infants that are smaller proportionally um, in terms of brain size. So our infants don't necessarily have absolutely small big brain or small brains, but their brains are born at a lower percentage of full adult size. So, for example, um, rhesus macaque brains are born at about 70% of adult size. Uh, they've got about 30%... <coughs> Luna! They've got about 30% of their brain growth that has to happen uh, after they're born. Um, chimpanzee brains are born at about 50% of adult brain size. They've got about 50% they have to grow during this long period of lactation. Humans are born at about 30% of adult brain size. So we have a much larger magnitude of brain growth that has to happen outside of the uterus, uh, which means that we have correspondingly long periods of uh, both infant and juvenile dependency. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit later about this difference between the juvenile period and um, 
and childhood. But chimpanzees, uh, you know, yes, they nurse for five years, but once they're weaned, they're self-feeding. Humans only nurse for maybe three or four years, but once we're weaned, we're still dependent upon our parents for another 15 to 14 years. So <clears throat> we have a much longer period of development and, and uh, childhood dependency. Um, many textbooks will say that natural selection struck a balance between the size of the birth canal and the ease with which we, we move bipedally. The data doesn't really show this. I mean, our, our, the shape of our birth canal changes, absolutely. And humans are the one species that absolutely needs help during the process of giving birth. However, babies aren't born because if they gestated longer, they'd get stuck in the birth canal headwise. They are born at the point that the uh, energetic efficiency of nutrients being transmitted through the placenta starts to drop off. So babies grow up until that point where they really can't grow efficiently in the uterus anymore. Um, and it's actually a signal from the developing fetus that triggers uh, labor um, on the part of the mother. So uh, at some point it becomes a better cost-benefit uh, ratio to continue to develop outside the womb um, and to rely on breast milk and then solid foods to subsidize your growth. Um, so this whole thing of it kind of being pelvic constraints that um, result in babies being born when they are, um, that doesn't bear up to further scrutiny. Um, there's some reproductive endocrinologists who are doing some really, really interesting work uh, that, that have helped to uncover this signal from the um, developing fetus that kind of jump starts or triggers labor and development. All right, so these brain changes and developmental changes are not present in early hominins. So not really applicable uh, to Australopiths, for example. They do start to become pronounced <coughs> and applicable as we see the advent of the genus Homo. We've got increasing reliance on tool use. We've got these Lamequian tools that we talked about that date to 3.3 million years. Um, we also recognize that primates have this generalized ability to learn um, and to also socially learn. Um, there's no reason for us to think that uh, that fossil hominins would not have at least had similar cultural capacities to chimpanzees, um, arguably given the uh, the environment that they are exploiting, um, they may have even been a little bit more cultural than chimpanzees. So, you know, as we look at the degree of social complexity and Machiavellian intelligence, I mean, baboons are kind of the ultimate of that and have larger group sizes and more sh social complexity than uh, common chimps do. And so that is associated with this terrestrial kind of savanna type habitat. Our tool use becomes more specialized throughout our evolutionary history. And then lastly, we've got teeth. We've got this big, these big back teeth, premolars and molars. This is an early hominin trait that has then been um, virtually eliminated, if not just you know minimized, during successive uh, evolution of the genus Homo. What this did was allowed for chewing tough, fibrous, thick vegetation. Um, so when you think about, uh, I like to talk about this mythical sweet potato, right? And <clears throat> the only reason I bring up a sweet potato is because almost everybody is familiar with a sweet potato. Uh, sweet potatoes relative to um, white potatoes are harder to cut. They're thicker, they're a bit more gritty. If you've ever taken a bite of a raw potato, you recognize that they've got this gritty texture to begin with, but then if you take a bite of a sweet potato relative to um, a white or a gold potato, you'll find that there's even more grit, that it's harder to chew. Um, and so you've got to have good knives if you're going to cut sweet potatoes or else you have to roast them first. Um, so imagine a diet based solely on chewing raw sweet potatoes. That is going to put phenomenal uh, selective pressure on the chewing apparatus. Um, and so um, this is not only associated with big teeth and thick enamel, this is also associated with massive musculature uh, and other skeletal facial features like broad cheeks and a sagittal crest and brow ridge. This rotary motion of chewing is also uh, responsible for favoring a reduction of canines um, and uh, premolars um, and is lost during subsequent human evolution uh, with a further reduction with the advent of fire. So once we start eating proportionately 
more meat. We are less reliant on this thick, fibrous, tough vegetation. Uh, we also see that the palate opens up. We end up with a broad, wide palate. This is going to be associated with some of the sounds that we can make. So this is going to impact future language development and language com linguistic complexity. Um, but it's also associated with, um, you know, firstly having to make room for these massive teeth um, that uh, evolve because of these dietary shifts.